Good evening. Um, welcome to the eve of Halloween. We're going to be discussing some really, um, yes, <laughs> I think I heard that out there, scary things. No, this is um, um, a, the, our forum, public forum for the city of Northampton for the uh, draft historic preservation plan. I'm Carolyn Mish with the city of Northampton Office of Planning and Sustainability. And we have uh, representatives from the Historical Commission and our consultant team who was um, hired by the city with support of the um, Historical Commission to help us draft this plan, which is part of the sustainable, will become part of a, the sustainable Northampton plan, will be adopted and become an element of the overall comprehensive plan for the city of Northampton. So we're really excited about this component that we really haven't been able to spend a lot of um, detail analysis and work on until this point. And um, we've had the um, great opportunity to be working with Barrett Associates to toward that end. And so this is what this evening is about, is sort of the presentation of this draft plan. Um, and before we start, I'm, we're going to turn over to our consultants, but before we start, we'll hear from Martha Lyon, who's representing the Historical Commission. Thank you. The green? Okay. Am I? Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for everyone for coming. Um, I see that there are members of the planning board here, which is great. And I know there are a number of people on virtually, which is also great. Can't you can't hear me. Okay. Should I do that? Is that better? Hmm. All right. <laughs> well, I can shout. Shall I shout? <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to say we uh, just met as a commission for our regular monthly meeting and uh, were uh, presented with a wonderful um, synopsis of what Historic Northampton is up to, the latest. And just sitting and listening to Betty Sharp and Lori Sanders, it makes me realize um, the historic resources of the city are so important and we are stewards of that as a commission. And I think that um, they become more important as that institution and then, of course, the Forbes Library have just increased their capacity and their outpouring. And uh, uh, this plan was really something that, um, in part, was, was the impetus for it was to try to make those institutions and the resources of the city just become much more a part of life here, uh, to get more people to understand what they are, what what is important about them, what the stories are, what the themes are. Um, and so um, that's kind of the, the soul of this. And I would just say that uh, as a commission, you know, we've long needed a roadmap to guide us into the types of decisions that we need to make, uh, the kinds of efforts that we need to launch to, again, help uh, further historic preservation in the city and to work with the other um, parts of Northampton, housing, economic development, open space preservation, et cetera, um, to really be integral to that. And so our hope in this plan is to um, get us off on a really good foot and get us working in that direction. So I just wanted to personally thank Judy and Kathy, who are both um, people I admire and with whom both I've worked in the past, and I respect you both so much professionally. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to you to give us a um, preview. I do believe it's green. Can you all hear me? Okay. I hope so. So I'm Judy Barrett. Um, I have a planning firm in Hingham, Barrett Planning Group. Uh, we do a lot of work on comprehensive plans. We do work uh, in the world of affordable housing as well as zoning and regulatory reform. Those are our, kind of our three core pieces. We do a lot of other things as well, but that tends to be our, our practice. And this is an element of a comprehensive plan. So it was very exciting to us to be able to work uh, on this. I, however, am not the only person on the team working on this. We were blessed to have Kathy uh, Broomer join us. Kathy's an architectural historian. She is the brains behind much of the, uh, the many of the recommendations you're gonna hear about this evening. So I'm very grateful to have had the chance to, to work with you. 
Um, so I'm just going to kind of kick this off a bit, and then we're really going to get into the recommendations of the draft um, that the city has. And I hope this is going to work. This does not seem to want to advance. Do you have any idea why? So, uh, you need to control it from here. It's not control. It's not so, moving. Um, but I first, oh, I'm going to mute. Sorry. No, um, I don't know why it's doing that. So an Adobe. Is it on? Oh, so it's uh, it's up and down. It's just need to go up and down, and you can. Yeah. And you can use the down key. That's oh. what I was just doing. Hmm. Let me see. Maybe the page. Oh, this is not good. The page down. So, I have to. Would you like to borrow my mouse if it's easier? You want me to try to use the PowerPoint to see if that. This is a PDF. Would you prefer that I try the PowerPoint? Or you can do it down or... That's no, what I was doing. It's not, oh, it's oh, not. Now it's working. Yeah, it just working. needed to be happy for a minute. Sorry about that, folks. Right. Right. Maybe now we'll see if this will work as well. So it is a plan and there's a framework to it. It actually has five, five sections. There's an executive summary, which is not written yet. And we typically don't write that until the rest of the plan is done because the executive summary ought to be a roadmap. Um, and really a like a focusing the reader on what are the key ideas in the plan. Um, and the same is really true with the introduction, but the, the meat of the plan is really sections three, four, uh, and five, which is, or three and four really, which is the investigation and analysis and the recommendations. So we decided tonight to focus on the recommendations because my experience and Martha, I think you've seen this, Kathy's probably seen it, city staff have seen it. When you start talking about a plan, everybody wants to get to what are we gonna do about it? So we decided to focus the, the uh, pre presentation on that, but of course, we're happy to take any questions about any other aspect uh, of the document. So the focus of the recommendations, there's, there's like six pieces to this. Um, the inventory recommendations, which is really a lot of what's in there, and Kathy's gonna talk about that. Uh, the National Register and Local District Priorities, Kathy's going to address those. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, increasing and improving public awareness and understanding and, and information. Uh, talk a little bit about municipal ordinances that perhaps should be looked at a little bit and maybe even strengthened. Um, looking at municipal policy and public investment and stewardship. So those are that, those are the goals under which the recommendations fall. This is very strange. Oops. It's important to put this in the context of the comprehensive plan. Um, it's a piece of that. So it is not a standalone. It doesn't govern itself, if you will. It's a component of a plan that has other issues in it. And the whole point of a comprehensive plan is to try to bring all those different concerns and interests into balance. So your comprehensive plan is a citywide guide to the city's physical evolution. Um, and it looks into a variety of other topics, land use, housing, economic development, open space and recreation, your natural resources, your community facilities, and certainly transportation. And all of those pieces need to come together in a coherent whole for the city to be able to move forward with a, a valid and implementable city plan. And historic preservation is a key part of that. Um, you know, this plan is a little unique compared with some other Massachusetts plans in that Northampton chose really early on relative to a lot of other communities to look at the, its future planning through the lens of sustainability and, and climate change. So that's another layer of this that's important to us as planners and certainly to uh, anyone in the field of historic preservation as well. There's actually been a lot of talk in the last couple of years about how do we, how do we accommodate historic preservation and climate change, climate resilience, climate adaptation? How do we accommodate all of those things that sometimes seem to be in conflict, but they, they don't need to be? Um, the other thing I will just point out about the comprehensive plan is the real challenge for planners, I think everywhere, is to try to figure out how do you harmonize and make sense out of broad public policy to address and harmonize things that may seem to be competing or conflicting interests. And so historic preservation is no exception to that. These are This is an issue that comes up with every single, single element of a master plan 
how do you bring these things into conversation with one, with one another? So looking specifically at the preservation plan, you know, there are certain objectives here. One is to support the historical commission's very vital and important work in preserving, uh, advocating for, and educating the community as well as stewardship and leadership. Those are all important functions of a historic uh, historical commission to elevate historic preservation as a basic function of city planning to make sure that it has an equally important and and vote and uh, you know influential presence uh, in the city's planning decisions and to strengthen the voice of preservation within city policy and regulatory uh, environments it's important to note that this doesn't override other elements of the plan it doesn't override other important city objectives it is subject to review by the historical commission, but because it's a component of a master plan, which is subject to state law, it is ultimately also subject to approval by the planning board. So both boards have a very important role to play in the execution of this plan. So we're gonna jump into the recommendations and many of these are, first ones are yours. Um, so I'm going to bring this right up to where you start. And if you want help with that, just let me know. Great. So the, uh, we're advancing how? We're sort of advancing with this arrow. The down arrow. Yes. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Kathy Broomer. Thank you very much for all coming out tonight. Uh, and forgive me, but I feel like I've got to look in every direction at the same time. So I, I don't want to miss anything that I planned on saying to you. So uh, I'll do my best to rotate my head. Um, we're up to protecting public. Yeah. Okay. In the context of a community's comprehensive planning process, preserving historic resources is achieved through preservation planning, which is a prescribed framework for protecting the public interest in historic places. The preservation planning process organizes preservation activities in a logical sequence to achieve preservation goals. And I don't know, I can't speak to other elements of the comprehensive planning process, whether you've got this fairly rigid um, but regulated uh, framework for doing things, but preservation planning really does. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not what we choose to make of it. It's what the National Park Service tells us we're going to make of it. The framework was established by the National Park Service and is conveyed through the states, which in our case is the Mass Historical Commission in Boston, to the local level, principally through the Northampton Historical Commission. Oh, thanks. So the two leading preservation groups in Northampton, as uh, Martha mentioned earlier, uh, are the Historical Commission and Historic Northampton, and both play such critical roles in furthering historic preservation in the city, and they've supported one another on numerous projects since preservation planning started in Northampton almost 50 years ago, which is kind of mind boggling. Um, because of the comprehensive planning nature of this project, our recommendations though, don't get into what historic Northampton should or should not be doing. Instead, our focus is on the city and the historical commission. Since commission members are appointed volunteers, the commission receives critical staff support from the planners in the uh, Office of Planning and Sustainability. And I believe the commission has vacancies at the moment and would welcome new members. Thanks. It's important to be able to justify and prioritize preservation planning decisions. And here are some of the parameters. Identify, evaluate, and protect is the preservation planning method that's handed down to us by the National Park Service. Like any municipal planning process, it's designed to encourage objectivity. So preservation decisions are not being driven by emotion or by nostalgia, that sentimental longing for the past. And to protect Northampton's historic resources, we have to identify where they are, what form they take, assess their condition and historic integrity and consider their history and then evaluate which ones are significant. And then we move on to impl implementing protection measures. 
Historic integrity is the ability of a resource to convey its historic associations, typically through its outward appearance and its, and its uh, detailing, architectural detailing, if it's a building. Highly altered resources tend to be lower priorities for preservation, but it's important to remember that preservation planning doesn't just apply to the high style um, architectural gems in a city or town. It applies to a wide range of uh, resources. Through the inventory process, the data gathering also considers themes in Northampton's history. Researching the themes gives us a historic context and a framework for being able to then assess the relative significance of the resources associated with that theme that survive. And the draft plan, we do have uh, some recommendations uh, regarding the themes. Significance is the importance of a researched resource to the history, architecture, or culture of the community. A single historic resource or area can be significant for its association with important events, important people, patterns of development within the community, and then of course the themes in the community's history. A building, for example, could be significant architecturally uh, for its design details and form. Also historic resources can be significant for their, their potential to yield important information in the future, such as uh, uh, information on construction methods from a certain time period. Oh, good. Now it's advancing properly. Yay. But, oh, good. <laughs> with one, with one, <laughs> one touch. Um, it's tough sometimes to develop priorities for preservation, but saving it all is definitely not the goal. The highest priorities for preservation community-wide are in that sweet spot in this diagram where age, historic integrity, and significance all come together. Age alone isn't sufficient. Um, and these two examples, by the way, uh, these two houses are not in Northampton. I, I just didn't want to be comparing one person's house to another. This yellow house retains a good amount of historic integrity. It has wood siding, two over two wood sash. It's got a lot of its architectural details. The gray house appears to be in excellent condition, but it retains less integrity and might be a lower priority for preservation as a standalone. But if it's part of a neighborhood of similar resources, then the integrity of the group is, is worth noting. Preservation planning recognizes that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And it's okay, integrity-wise, for alterations to have been made. They just need to be weighed as part of, as a consideration in assessing integrity. The historic properties inventory is used to gather the necessary facts about historic resources so that preservation decisions are justified and also to uh, use those inventory forms to advocate for preservation. It works now, here you go. Oh, wow, <clears throat> okay. On this, right? Yeah, so you're on the right slide. All right, thanks. Northampton started surveying its uh, historic properties almost 50 years ago. The draft plan provides more details about the strengths and limitations of the city's legacy survey, which was prepared mostly in the 1970s and 1980s and was considered outstanding at the time it was done. Northampton was really quite far ahead of other communities in terms of nailing down what needed to be covered in an inventory. The only problem is that what needed to be covered in an inventory uh, has changed since the 70s and 80s. So hence the need to expand and update the city's inventory. There was a substantial update project in 2010 to 2011. But Northampton would not be well served today operating with a master plan that dates to the 1970s. And the, preser the historic properties inventory too is a planning document that has to be updated and expanded routinely to serve more advanced preservation uh, needs citywide. So the city's inventory is the basis for preservation planning decisions, but it also has great value as a record of Northampton's history for public information and education purposes. Um, and the kicker is that Northampton's inventory now, so many inventory forms are 40 some odd years old that the inventory actually has value itself itself as a historical record of <laughs> freezing 
you know, sometimes when I need to know what did a property look like 30, 40 years ago, is that an alteration or, or, or not? I can look at the inventory and see what it looked like in 1975. And so that is useful. But that's what not what you want to be doing for planning purposes. You want to have more up-to-date uh, data. Um, also, just a word about archaeological sites. Those are inventory too, but to protect site locations, that portion of a city and town's inventory is not a public record. So it's not a public record at the state level, and, and information on archaeological sites should not be uh, disseminated at the local level either. Um, this project focuses on what's known as above ground historic resources or non archaeological. Um, archaeological survey and site protection have different requirements that have to be addressed in, a, uh, in detail in a separate study, and we've made that recommendation in the plan. The inventory doesn't confer any historic designations on a property, it's simply an inventory. It's taking stock of who, what, where, when, why, how, all those types of questions. Many historically and architecturally notable areas and individual resources are not currently in Northampton's inventory. And that's simply the result of uh, time and budget constraints on earlier survey projects. That is not, the absence of a resource or a neighborhood in the inventory is not an indication that they lack historic value or don't deserve to be included. They simply, you, you have to do this in stages. You can't get everything all in at once. Um, please take a look online at the Mass Historical Commission's MACRIS database, or uh, as an alternative, the paper files that are here locally, and you'll see inventory forms and mapping for Northampton's resources that have been identified to date. And here's a screenshot of the Mass Historical Commission MACRIS database. All inventory and National Register nominations produced in Northampton get fed into the statewide historic properties inventory um, maintained in Boston. Um, there needs to be much greater awareness in Northampton of the existence of the historic property inventory. Um, we recommend that the city link PDF files from the MACRIS database to that parcel details section of the city's online mapping, the GIS and uh, the assessor's platform. And these PDFs are found, uh, the last two columns on this screenshot, uh, one is titled INV for inventory form and one is titled NR for national register nominations at the far right. And clicking on those the, and obtaining the PDF document also uh, gives you a list of any historic designations that apply to that particular property. Current and prospective property owners residents, realtors, and other interested parties would benefit from having a more complete picture of a property or neighborhood's history. Okay, so general goals uh, with the inventory. Northampton's historic properties inventory currently presents a skewed picture of what survives with a number of neighborhoods and resource types uh, that are underrepresented and, and merit inclusion. Um, general goals including, include adding concentrations of historic resources uh, located beyond the downtown. And when I say beyond downtown, I mean beyond those downtown properties along Main Street and up Elm Street that are already in designated historic districts. Mill villages, agricultural settlements, historic residential neighborhoods are not adequately represented by today's survey standards. And even some downtown neighborhoods that generally speaking are considered downtown are not represented at all. And our recommendations uh, address those neighborhoods. Another general area that needs to be beefed up is historic areas and individual resources built from circa 1930 to 1975. Why those dates? For preservation planning purposes, surveys generally target resources that are at least 50 years old at the time of survey. And that's, um, that's partly due to the desire, again, to be more objective and allow us an adequate amount of time to have passed before we're trying to assess the uh, significance of a, of a resource. So when Northampton first started surveying in the 1970s, the cutoff date was circa 1930. 
Now the cutoff date is circa 1975. So that's a pretty big jump of uh, properties in terms of time period that, that aren't, for the most part, included. Most of the post-1930 resources that are in the inventory are commercial or institutional buildings or bridges because uh, what used to be uh, known as the Mass Highway Department uh, did a very comprehensive uh, statewide survey of bridges and, and a lot of uh, bridges are in Northampton's inventory for that reason. And just so you know, some cities and towns in Massachusetts have already bitten the bullet and they're starting to survey their post-World War II neighborhoods. And we have a recommendation for that in the plan as well. Uh, a range of landscape types from different historic periods is needed. Aside from cemeteries, Northampton's inventory includes surprisingly few examples of design parks and landscapes and rural historic landscapes. And under that rural historic landscape title um, also includes industrial landscapes in mill villages. Um, I think there's the cemeteries are in Bridge Street Cemetery has a lot of documentation and there's maybe one form from the 70s for Pulaski Park and that's about it. And there's really more out there that deserves uh, a, a look. Please uh, refer to the flyer, what are historic resources? And I think we'll also uh, try to include a copy of that as an appendix in the plan. Um, note that indiv individual trees Wetland and conservation areas and wildlife habitats are not what we're talking about here. Preservation planning tools are not intended to identify, evaluate, and protect these types of nat natural resources. And uh, finally, with the general goals, most of the research in Northampton's inventory is more than 40 years old. Even the 2010, 2011 forms frequently referred to they sort of restated the information that appears on the forms from the 70s and 80s. So there's really a very high demand for telling much more inclusive stories than we were telling back in the 80s. Um, and it's possible to get into much more detail about who was living in these houses, what were their you know, ethnic groups, what were their business associations in the community, we can tell so so many more uh, detailed stories now, but it has to be added to the inventory. And there's a very high demand for it, and we have a recommendation for that in the plan as well. <clears throat> okay, so for area inventory recommendations, our neighborhood may not be a historic district, but it is historic. We have, uh, our team has heard that statement or variations of it early and often. Um, through this process, and it's a valid statement. Uh, it's essential that Northampton have better documentation of its historic resources through the inventory process so the city as a municipality and as a community can plan to preserve historic areas in a, in a proactive way instead of being forced to just react to proposals that may adversely affect um, the historic integrity of those areas. So we conducted field work citywide as part of this project and our team recommended 22 areas as high priorities for addition to Northampton's inventory or for inventory updates. Does that mean they're the only areas in town that merit inclusion? No, but these, these 22 jumped out at us. And by the way, an inventory is never complete. So it's, it's gonna keep rolling on and there will always be a need to keep updating it. Um, all of the areas that we identified have the potential to merit some kind of protection in some form in the future, but we don't know until we get more concrete information on the, the history and the significance of those areas. And we'll get to uh, some of those options shortly. We flagged eight areas as critical priorities because their streetscapes still retain a great deal of historic integrity with a mix of later development, which is to be expected. And most of the areas on this list also reflect the range of uh, historic villages and settlements outside the downtown that uh, merit closer attention. Some of these areas were surveyed and recommended in the past for historic district status, but for whatever reason, districts were not pursued. And here are additional area recommendations. And you can see we, we put them into tiers, critical, 
meaning do it tomorrow, uh, necessary and important. Some are broad survey areas where the boundaries uh, can be refined in, in the future if districts are desired. It's very common to survey a broader neighborhood and then tighten the boundaries um, if you're actually gonna pursue any type of uh, district protection. Um, in some areas here, there were individual properties surveyed in 2010, 2011, but uh, a sampling of individual properties scattered throughout a neighborhood uh, does document those properties, but doesn't always convey, again, that idea that the whole is greater than the sum of, of its parts. So that's why we recommend some of these neighborhoods for area forms. Area recommendations in the draft plan are very specific about which streets to document. And one of the reasons we did that is to save everybody some time and uh, allow you to move forward with surveying without having to waste a lot of time debating, well, where should the limits of this area, uh, how far should the limits of this area go? Um, we can tell you just from our experience creating historic districts and looking at historic integrity, um, by giving you those specific streets and addresses, you're getting the uh, lion's share of historic integrity that you need to be uh, considering. And in the plan, you'll also find details on the recommended action for each area. We're going to have maps in the uh, recommended uh, with the recommended area boundaries that'll be in the final document. And just so you know, just for a point of clarification, some of these are self-explanatory, but Bay State Village Residential. Uh, it's just the term we came up with for the residential area north and east of the historic Mill Village core on the Mill Ri River. So the, the core, Riverside Drive, going from uh, connecting the two uh, mill sites is recommended as a critical priority. And then the balance of Bay State Residential is recommended as a, as a necessary priority. And then Elm Street North and Elm Street South, those terms come from the uh, 2010 survey. Elm Street North is basically uh, abutted by the abuts the Elm Street local historic district, uh, I believe possibly the Smith campus and Childs Park. And Elm Street South is bound by the uh, Elm Street local historic district, Smith campus, Mill River, and the high school campus. To uh, a few more uh, inventory recommendations to facilitate coordination between the Northampton Historical Commission and other city boards and departments, all pre-1975 resources owned by the city of Northampton should be represented in the inventory. We've included a table in the plan that shows which properties have yet to be documented. And frankly, if, if you have city-owned buildings that have inventory forms from the 1970s and 80s, those need to be beefed up too for planning purposes so that everyone is singing from the same sheet of music when decisions need to be made as to whether a building is gonna be deaccessioned or uh, renovations are gonna be done. You don't wanna be relying on uh, information that's 40 plus years old. Houses of worship pose unique preservation challenges as uh, Northampton is seen in recent years. We've recommended that a citywide survey of these buildings be completed to help document their relative, relative to one another, architectural and historical significance to the community. And one thing about houses of worship is that very often the community that they serve actually exceeds the boundaries of the, the town that, that the building is in and might be significant to uh, other towns as well. A survey of historic outbuildings, barns, carriage houses, garages, et cetera, is needed to determine their relative integrity and significance and support the historical commission's review under the city's demolition ordinance. There are several properties in the cent central business core design review district that don't have inventory forms. Mm -hmm. In a perfect world, uh, all historic properties subject to design review in the city would have an inventory form. That's in a perfect world, but we realize it, it's not always a perfect world. The plan also includes a number of recommendations for surveying individual properties that just came to our attention along the way. Um, many of them in the 
central and western part of Northampton. And finally, it would be a good practice to require an updated inventory form be submitted with applications for building specific community preservation funding. Um, it, it's just, it's a, it's a good idea to have that information on hand and that applications for CPC funding are um, a good opportunity to request that that information um, be submitted. Once a historic resource is gone, it's gone forever. Demolition review uses a collaborative problem solving approach for ensuring that alternatives have been considered for historic resources proposed for total demolition. The demolition review ordinance allows the historical commission to delay demolition of a significant and preferably preserved building or structure for up to 12 months while alternatives are explored. But the ordinance can't prevent demolition. With the Elm Street Historic District and the Central Business Core Architecture Districts, both of those are design review districts and there's more leverage in preventing demolition. It's recommended the city consider lengthening the demolition delay period to 12 or 24 months. It's been done in other towns and it's something that would have to be researched more to see if other the towns that did it find it effective. And really the intent is to it does have a bit of a punitive intent. The goal is to make sure that people are not just waiting out the demolition delay while they get their ducks in a row to proceed with uh, demolishing. The intent is really to encourage uh, uh, applicants to actively engage with the historical commission on coming up with alternatives, or if those prove not to be feasible, then coming up with suitable mitigation measures. And in addition, there's a provision in the ordinance that allows the historical commission to initiate a landmark study process if the end of the 12 month delay period is approaching without alternatives having been discussed. Um, it's something that's used effectively in other cities and towns. I don't believe it's ever been used in Northampton, but it's something that, uh, it's a tool that's available to the commission under the existing um, ordinance. National Register. Uh, once historic resources are inventoried, they can be evaluated for possible nomination to the National Register of Historic Places. And in Northampton, almost 500 resources have been listed either as part of one of these eight districts or individually. And despite the name, properties don't need to be of national significance to be in the National Register. It, the national part just refers to the federal government's role in compiling that list. Most National Register properties in Northampton are actually of local significance, but there are some that have been uh, determined to be of state significance. You won't see a list of recommended historic districts in the draft plan. Northampton's historic areas can't be properly evaluated in the absence of more detailed documentation of their historic integrity and their importance to the community. We, we just don't have the inventory that's needed to uh, serve as the basis for those recommendations. But we have conveyed what appear to be to our team the highest priorities for district designation using those three tiers of inventory recommendations. So you can safely assume that the ones that are designated a critical inventory priority are your highest priorities for potential districts based on what we see now with their historic integrity. In the case of National Register, the city would have to obtain an eligibility opinion from the Mass Historical Commission to proceed with any uh, district or individual nomination. And that requires updated inventory as well. Uh, the Mass Historical Commission will not entertain, uh, they won't give up an eligibility opinion based on an inventory form from the 1980s. They have to know, and the reason for that, which is totally reasonable on their part, is they have to be able to assess the historic integrity of the building today, not what it looked like uh, 40 some odd years ago. In addition to the National Register, there are other protection options for districts and this table appears in the draft plan. I apologize that it's so dense. Um, let's look at the district options first and then uh, we'll move on to individual or standalone historic resources. Uh, mostly talked about the National Register, but uh, the Pomeroy Terrace District 
evolved from the survey update project that was completed in 2011. And uh, there was a little bit of misinformation circulating uh, in the last few months connected to this project about the Pomeroy Terrace Historic District. It is a National Register District. It's not a local historic district, and it is not a design review district. A local historic district is designated under Mass General Laws Chapter 40C, and it's the strongest protection for a historic area or neighborhood. This is a design review district, and the Northampton Historical Commission wears many hats, including serving as the uh, city's district commission uh, after the two commissions. There were once two separate commissions, and they were merged in 2013. So the Historical Commission reviews applications for exterior alterations, demolition, and new construction. There's an established design review process with design guidelines for allowing changes in the Elm Street District in a manner that protects the area's historic integrity as it's viewed from the public way. Uh, use of a 40C district doesn't have to be limited to what some have called the fancy neighborhoods of Northampton. The city's existing historic districts ordinance also includes a number of exemptions to review. It's intended to encourage routine repair and maintenance. Paint color and landscaping are not reviewed, correct? Yeah. Um, also, uh, property owners in a local district are not expected to restore their houses to, to their original appearance. The third option for districts is the most... Uh, nebulous architectural preservation district or neighborhood conservation district. And I apologize, it's a little uh, blocked up there. These types of districts are not well defined in Massachusetts and that lack of, lack of definition has created some problems. Generally speaking, any preservation friendly design related district established under the home rule amendment to the mass constitution tends to fit into this category, including Northampton's Central Business Core Architecture District, which is administered by the Central Business Architecture Committee and regulates uh, new construction, alterations, and, and demolition. The comparisons in this chart, by the way, apply only to Central Business Core and not to neighborhood conservation districts generally. And the reason for that is so many different cities and towns are doing so many different things under the name of a neighborhood conservation district that there is no one definition for uh, what it regulates. The Central Business Core Architecture District now is uh, pretty closely aligned with uh, Northampton's zoning. Where the Central Business Core Architecture District has succeeded some other general ordinance or home rule preservation districts in Massachusetts have failed. There was a 2019 land court decision that invalidated all of the neighborhood conservation districts in one town. And our team has not identified any new neighborhood conservation districts adopted under home rule since that decision in 2019. The decision made clear that a city can't use the home rule amendment to adopt a general ordinance Re regulating the same matters that they're already empowered to regulate under Chapter 40A, which is the State Zoning Act, and Chapter 40C, which is the State Historic District Act. So this decision sort of put an end to what a lot of communities were doing, cherry picking a little bit from zoning and cherry picking a little from historic and rolling it all together and, and inventing a new kind of district. Also since 2019, the Mass Historical Commission has changed the name on its sample ordinance and bylaw language. They used to call it a neighborhood conservation district, and now they call it an architectural preservation district, which shifts the focus back to preserving historic architecture first and foremost. There is little doubt that several historic neighborhoods in Northampton would benefit from some type of district recommendation or district designation. And our team recommends that Northampton, or that neighborhood conservation districts, if they're going to be designed as home rule or general ordinances, be studied in coordination with the city's legal counsel because the ramifications of that 2019 land court decision are still not clear. We don't know for sure if that decision has now eliminated neighborhood conservation districts going forward or or cities and towns just need to be much more careful about what they're trying to 
uh, push through as a neighborhood conservation district. And ultimately, you need the attorney general's office to um, approve it. A cleaner approach and one that we've noted in uh, the draft plan may be accomplishing neighborhood conservation through amendments to the zoning ordinance, which some towns have done. Or if it's going to be a home rule ordinance, focus on architectural preservation and avoid the temptation mm -hmm. to dabble in too much zoning. Protection options for individual historic resources. Here are some of the most common options. And this table is also in the draft plan. With the National Register, just be aware that uh, nas while National Register districts are limited to exteriors only, if a property is going to be listed individually in the National Register, it has to retain its historic integrity on the interior as well as the exterior. Designation of individual properties under Chapter 40C has not been used in Northampton so far. <laughs> The Commonwealth Historic Districts Act allows one or more buildings or structures to be designated as a district, resulting in the single building historic district option. And City of Somerville has 189 single building historic districts, which has got to be a nightmare of management. But that's the way they decided to go instead of trying to create uh, Chapter 40C local districts. These single building districts are subject to design review, and it's something we recommend Northampton consider, mostly as a more streamlined and cost-effective alternative to preservation restrictions. And some cities and towns, a small number, do have a local landmark ordinance, but most uh, tend to use the single building historic district uh, concept. Preservation restrictions are the strongest protection for individual resources with property specific conditions for physical changes that are written right into the restriction and recorded at the registry of deeds. So the PRs can also apply to the interior of the building. And there are recommendations in the draft plan for setting up a process for better monitoring of preservation restrictions in the city. A routine monitoring of these properties by a preservation architect is important to ensure compliance with the restriction terms. Um, uh, preservation restrictions should not be seen as simply a, a flag on the building department file or the planning files that uh, there's something important going on. Northampton has basically created two classes of preservation restrictions, those approved by the Mass Historical Commission under Mass General Laws Chapter 184, and those established by the city as a condition of granting a permit or variance or declaring a historic municipal building a surplus. Not sure why this is happening, that there are two different classes of preservation restrictions and, and it's not, they're all called preservation restrictions, but they're not all taking the typical pre preservation planning path. But if it's going to continue, it's essential that the historical commission be in the loop on all preservation restrictions created in and by the city and that a formal monitoring program be implemented because monitoring is one of the reasons why you do a preservation restriction in the first place. Okay, I just had a couple more slides. Um, advocacy, is this preservation planning? Just wanted to share the results of this survey question with everyone. Many residents during this process have shared concerns with our team that are widely perceived to come under the general umbrella of historic preservation, but actually exceed the limits of preservation planning tools. Preserving the character of historic neighborhoods requires a more integrated planning approach. Issues can't be remedied with preservation planning tools alone. So in our online survey a few months ago, we asked which of these three goals was most important to people in preserving historic neighborhoods that are not already designated historic districts. And I should say, Oh, it should be uh, A, B, and C. Uh, our slide uh, succumbed to the auto. Uh, that must be my fault. Auto lettering. I it's all right. <laughs> um, it's choice A, choice B, and choice C. But I, what I was going to say is that there should be, or uh, some folks were very annoyed that we did not present a choice D, allowing people to say all of the above. And we said, no, the point of this question is we want people to come down on the particular issue that you consider to be of the greatest importance when it comes to preserving these historic neighborhoods. 
What we were not expecting was that the results would be so evenly distributed yeah. across the three questions. So the first one, 34% of the respondents selected the first choice, ensuring the architectural character of historic buildings is protected with alterations and additions of compatible design. That's preservation planning, and we have the tools for that. 39% of the respondents picked the middle choice, which was limiting the size, scale, setback, and density of new construction that replaces a demolished building. There's no question that these factors impact the character of historic neighborhoods, but at their core, they're zoning, not preservation planning. And remember that 2019 land court decision, we are not being encouraged to dabble in zoning under the guise of preservation planning. And then 27% of the respondents picked the last choice, reducing the impact of construction on significant trees or other natural features of the streetscape or parcels. That's site plan review through the planning board or significant tree review through the planning board, or in the case of protecting natural resources, wetlands, wildlife habitats, the conservation commission, that's not preservation planning. We just don't have the tools for that. Our team has received so many impassioned pleas and very valid opinions for help in dealing with redevelopment in historic neighborhoods and maintaining the visual character that people want to see preserved. You have been heard, and nobody needs to convince our team that there are issues out there that folks have been legitimately upset about. But if you're a uh, choice B, the second choice, or a uh, choice C, the third choice uh, person, it's essential that you first recognize the limits of historic preservation planning tools, and secondly, direct your concerns to the and advocacy efforts to the city board or commission that actually has the authority to do something about it. And that's 40, 70% of the respondents. If you add B and C together. Yeah, yeah, two, two thirds. Um, so, uh, and that's, those are people who should not, it's understandable that folks figure I want to preserve my neighborhood, I want to preserve everything about my neighborhood, but there are limits to what we can preserve uh, using preservation planning tools. And finally, here's a, a slide. How many people were responding in the um, off, I don't remember. Off the top of my head, I... I don't remember. I'd have to look it up. Yeah, I, question. I apologize. I, th I think it might be in the ballpark of 150 people. And so that means 100 people uh, picked the zoning choice or the, the uh, site plan review and conservation commission choice. And frankly, that's 100 people too many. Um, so, you know, one of the things we're trying to do with this planning process is to sort out what is and is not preservation planning so everyone uh, understands what can and cannot be done. Uh, and finally, here's a, oops, did I already, uh, just a tip of the iceberg list of some of Northampton's uh, preservation advocates and the Historical Commission cannot uh, implement all of these recommendations on their own. Um, it really requires an integrated planning approach. And as Judy said earlier, uh, Preservation of her heritage resources, as the way it was described in Sustainable Northampton, is on equal footing with all of the other things that uh, the Sustainable Northampton plan um, uh, addresses. And, and you don't want to see historic preservation be an afterthought or something that people thought was basically already dealt with because the highest style buildings downtown have already been protected. We, we do need to um, sort of even the playing field and get preservation planning tools applied to uh, the city from boundary to boundary. Okay, yeah, I think that was, yes. thanks. Thank so one of the reasons I'm glad that survey question is in here is that it just takes me back to so many comprehensive plans and master plans I've worked on where we ask the community to talk about the things that concern them. And they bring up a lot of issues and the challenge for planners is to figure out which pot does this belong in? What is the most effective way to answer the concern that people have raised? 
Is it a preservation strategy? Is it a zoning, a land use strategy? Is it a conservation strategy from the perspective of environmental resources? Is it a transportation or a mobility strategy? So sometimes, you know, the beauty of planning is that it pe really people can just sort of say whatever they want, and that's very helpful, but it falls to us to figure out what bucket do these things go in. So I appreciate the fact that you had put that question in there because it's it's made all of us, I think, think a lot about the particular concerns here and how best to direct them. Um, and then still have us be able to focus on what we were asked to do, which was a, which is a preservation plan, a historic preservation plan. So I wanna just talk a little bit about the other recommendations in here, um, going beyond the, uh, the just wonderful work that, that Kathy did. We were here, as many of you may or may not know, we did a variety of uh, activities to try to meet people in Northampton and talk to them about things they value and love and cherish about the city and things that concerns them. And this is just a running list of the various times that we were either out here or engagement activities that we did online or surveys or, or whatever and and learned a lot. And I wanna tell you, we appreciate everything that we, that we heard uh, and learned from the people uh, who live here. I think that there are some things that might help the community in terms of making sure the public understands um, the role that preservation planning plays in the life and vitality of a community. Just because there has been some confusion about what really is historic preservation planning. So one of the things that really I think does help in communities that have it is sort of an awards program where you know, there's a way to recognize privately uh, funded preservation efforts, whether it's re restoration or adaptive reuse, or even historically sensitive new construction, but just to be able to say, that's an example of what we want to see in our community and to, to reward that in some way uh, through an awards program. And there are other communities that, that do this, and it's something the commission may want to consider, or the planning board, or however you want to execute that kind of recommendation. I also think it's important for people to have available to them uh, just understanding alternatives to demolition, some examples of of historically sensitive remodeling uh, that has happened either here or perhaps even other communities in the in the region, renovation ideas from other communities. Um, you know, Cape Cod Commission has a, a wonderful collection of demolition delay success stories that some people might really appreciate. And so, yes, it's Cape Cod, it's not the Pioneer Valley, but who cares? The point is just look at what look at what has been done and maybe be able to adapt that to your own community. Um, a lot of the pictures in this and eventually that will be in the report were actually taken by my son. We've been out here, we were out here together once and he came back and took a lot of pictures. And one of the things we both noticed as we were driving all over the city was being in a place that we knew was was important because we had identified it in the plan and not really having any sense at all as just bystanders coming by to, to get pictures. What What is it that makes this special or significant? And so it this is actually something that's not in the draft. I just want to confess that because it was something that occurred to us as we were here. And that is really thinking about ways to use some type of outdoor exhibit program, uh, self-guided interpretive exhibits or or so-called um, you know wayside exhibits really throughout the city. I mean, you have lots of areas as Kathy has, has documented so well in the plan where just being able to sort of stop by and find out wh what it is about this place that really matters. And there are lots of great examples of this. The thing you have to be careful about is that you don't want everybody just going out and putting signs out and telling the story as perhaps they know it, you wanna have this, the program kind of coordinated. So it really does involve kind of a professional interpreters, uh, you know, probably from your own existing organizations who can help kind of plan out what this might be, help to design it, and then enlisting community resources in, in bringing this thing to light. But I think it would be very helpful to people to understand kind of what is truly historically significant, important about different parts of the city. It's not just about downtown, as I think you all know, um, but be able to tell that story everywhere. So much of this is about storytelling. The inventories do that. And so does a program like this. And this is very much geared toward public understanding. Um, if you're going to do something like this, it often helps to brand it some way. 
I, I get tired of that term, but I mean, to have some sort of, you know, a graphically identifiable way of saying, this is Northampton's story, this is Northampton's story, and to be able to repeat that in your various uh, wayside interpretive signage or kiosks and so forth would be a great thing to do so people understand what it is that they're seeing as they're driving by and they want to stop. Um, using the city's website as a as a more effective tool for information, Kathy already covered this, but being able to link the macro system, the macro system is wonderful. And I, I have to tell you, I think Mass Historical and Mass GIS, the agencies that work together to create this, they really do an amazing job keeping this up to date. We use it all the time, not only for historic preservation elements of plans, but even other elements that we're working on, just trying to understand the the story of the community's evolution is extremely helpful. Um, you know, and, and also just acknowledging the commission's role in, in terms of its regulatory review, its, its advocacy and support, um, and, and what it does for the city kind of just recognize that on perhaps the department's, uh, you know, landing page, just make that more pr prominent. Um, the other thing I have to tell you, and I'm, I know we're going to get this solved, but We've been trying to make a number of maps uh, using the city's assessor's data. And one of the things that is just conspicuously missing from the standard assessor's database that we get is the year built field for buildings. So to be able to map just the year, the you know, the, the eras in which different construction occurred and be able to see all of that on a map is absolutely moving. You know, Martha and I have done some work together and you've seen what that map, that map just tells such a story. We haven't been able to make it. So I know that in speaking with Carol and before the meeting, we will be able to get that information. That map's gonna be in this plan if it's the last thing I do. Um, and then as Kathy had said to linking the PDFs from the MACRIS database to your assessor's database. So if someone clicks on a map, they can open it up and say, oh my gosh, that's really, look at this, this is important. It's too bad it's 40 years old, but you know, but it's here's information that we need to have. Um, thinking about perhaps expanding some collaboration with the college, um, the faculty and students to kind of pres further preserve our preservation efforts uh, at the property and neighborhood level, um, to be able to engage in them in research and study of the historic landscapes would be very appropriate and might be very interesting to students in American studies. Uh, environmental science, policy, history. I mean, there's a variety of disciplines that would find this this kind of work interesting, at least in my experience, um, having worked with um, you know interns from the colleges in the Boston area. This kind of project is, is great, and it might be something to consider is kind of strengthening those kinds of partnerships and use that capacity to your advantage. Um, on the municipal ordinance side, um, you know, you could certainly, and I suspect you probably will at some point, consider additional form-based zoning districts um, or NCDs, neighborhood conservation districts, um, to guide new construction that doesn't overwhelm the historic development patterns in various neighborhoods. I, I just want to underscore that if you're, whether you're doing this as an NCD or a form-based code, Funding the effort adequately is really important. There's there's scary stuff that happens when you create a district without adequate documentation. That some board at some point has to administer that ordinance. And when you don't have enough information and it's now as of right, you can sometimes end up with unintended consequences. So just make sure if you're gonna go down this path that you fund it adequately to get the help you need so that the district is documented properly. Um, amending the demolition delay ordinance, we've a number of the communities I work with have gone to 24 months at this point, because the 12 months, especially in a hot market, is just not enough to really discourage people. Um, so thinking about expanding that is important. I would also point out that in Nantucket, um, which I grant you has a different set of issues, um, it goes beyond the age of the building. Nantucket simply doesn't want demolition because it creates construction debris that then has to go somewhere. So Nantucket has some fairly liberal ordinances around, or bylaws rather, it's a town, um, around what happens if you just have a structure on your property you don't want to keep. It can be relocated, which, you know, from a preservation point of view, is not the best thing in the world, but it's better than tearing it down. Um, Lexington has fairly liberal uh, provisions in its zoning bylaw to allow uses in historic buildings that, um, that would otherwise not be allowed, but in the interest of trying to protect and preserve 
um, those uses would be permitted um, subject to review by the planning board. So there's kind of things you can think about in terms of knitting ordinances together to get what you're trying to, uh, to get at. And then discouraging demolition by neglect, perhaps through having minimum maintenance ordinances, uh, ordinance such as other cities have. We actually just worked on this with Fitchburg. Lowell and Somerville also have the same thing. You know, to, and just maybe to determine whether something like this might be helpful to Northampton. We don't know that it necessarily would be, but it's it is out there as a conversation piece, so you don't end up with a situation where people just say, "I won't bother going to the commission. I'll just wait and I'll just let this essentially fall apart," and that doesn't benefit anybody. So it's something else to consider. Um, you might want to consider adding alternates or designees to represent the commission's interests. Uh, at, uh, at, at in other, other bodies such as the Community Preservation Committee or capital, um, you know, the capital planning group or to coordinate with public works and central services on the care and management of city-owned properties. Um, I, I think this is an area where some better communication really could benefit all of you. It's just how CPC, how the planning department, how the, the DPW and central services communicate about the resources that are available to be the best possible stewards you can be for city-owned uh, properties. Um, leading the way as a city for um, acting on behalf of preservation. So integrating preservation principles and processes and conservation treatments into your capital planning projects so that, um, so that the city is actually doing what it should do for its own properties, what you hope is going to happen out in the community for those which are privately owned. Um, my experience is that new development and preservation really can be great partners. Um, they are not always, but they can be. So thinking about, you know, understanding and documenting and identifying the historic resources kind of during the site planning process and the design process to, discern, to determine how best to sort of preserve them, the more you can consult with people before they actually have a project and have spent a lot on engineering plans that are now in front of a board, the more there's like the ability to communicate with people about what matters, the more likely it is that you may be able to execute some preservation where perhaps none may have otherwise occurred. Um, participating in the um, Mass Historical Commission's virtual workshops, and I'm sure commission members and staff probably do, but we wanna just underscore the importance of doing that. I've actually had the staff in my office just attend a number of these because they're so helpful. Um, there's a lot of training sessions and workshops available that keep you kind of up to date on what's happening, including about things like uh, what's happened with that neighborhood conservation district um, that was uh, disqualified by the land court. Identifying additional funding um, for preservation planning staff. I can't, um, I can't believe what the staff and the planning department get done. I, I'm just, I'm in awe of you guys. And I think I just think there's a lot of expectation on the part of city staff to be able to make a whole lot of things happen. The fact is when you look at some other bigger communities and you say, why can't we do what they do? Why can't we do what they do? Well, I work in those places, much bigger planning departments than you have here. So, so to be able to perhaps add some staff to the planning department, even if it's part-time, just to be able to provide more capacity to do some of the things that you all wanna do in preservation. Um, and maybe even having, um, you know, a, a, a part-time position or perhaps a consultant on call uh, is another thing that some communities do, not only for the permitting process, but also just public, uh, public information, planning educational activities in the community um, so that people really understand what preservation is about. Um, researching and applying for grants. Um, the survey and planning grant program is a customarily used one for inventories and um, you know looking at creating uh, local historic districts or national register districts, but it takes capacity to go after those grants. It's hard to do. So thinking about how do you build that capacity in the inside city hall to make those things happen. It is not reasonable to expect the historical commission who are volunteering their time to do all of that. It, if you wanna get these things done, you need to invest in capacity. Um, and I think, oh, and just a few other things. We, we think it would be helpful. I, I have seen this done in a number of communities and I think it's a really good idea to make sure that the historical commission is part of the group that's customarily asked to review applications that come in before the planning board or, or whomever. 
they don't have to root, they don't have to comment. If it's not something that you are concerned about or that you think is important, you don't have to comment. I can absolutely imagine that there are other reviewing parties for site plan review and special permits and so forth who don't comment. But you would be at least able to do that if you thought it was important. And so that's really, I think, a simple tweak, either in the planning board or ZBA's rules and regulations or perhaps in the ordinance, but just to make it clear that a historical commission should be asked to review and comment on these things. Um, and certainly any CPA applications that involve um, funding for historic preservation projects. Um, as Kathy had mentioned earlier, making sure that you kind of require an updated form for CPA applications that you're going to fund. Um, and then the other thing I just want to point out is, I can't underscore this enough, their communities have certain tools they bring to any planning question. It's the same, it's the same set of tools, it's just the emphasis is a little different. Um, you have regulatory authority, you have funding, you have capital improvements, and you have leadership. Those are the things that communities can bring to carrying out any planning activity. Um, I think some better way to connect the funding folks who make decisions about where city money is going, especially on the capital improvement side, CPA, uh, capital improvements, central services, there needs to be a better way for folks to, to communicate so that when there's a project that needs attention in a city historic building, that people who are making these decisions have a, the ability to say, well, that's CPA eligible or that's CDBG eligible or excuse me, community development block grant. Uh, or this is really a capital project. And just to make sure that city resources are being used as effectively and efficiently as possible. So just think about how the information is fed into those different funding systems and who's talking to whom. I think maybe some better communication and just being as flexible as you can be around the definition of what constitutes maintenance under CPA. This is not just a challenge for Northampton. It's been a challenge in a lot of communities. How do you become as flexible as you can be where something might be routine maintenance on a newer building, but on an older building, it's critical for preservation. So think about how you define and apply some of those terms. Um, pursuing your a designation as a certified local government, that's a specific designation that communities may apply for and qualify for uh, if they have adequate capacity to do it. Um, it endows the commission with some additional um, uh, uh, review or, or, or review powers, or in some cases, authority. Um, but what it really does is it opens up and increases competitiveness for things like survey and planning grants. And that's just really important. Uh, and then also having a restrict a log of your preservation restrictions so that uh, so it's online and people can find it just to understand like where are the restrictions of whatever type they are, whether they came through permitting or they came through the acquisition of a deed restriction, what are they? So people can actually understand where they are and you guys can understand where they are to be able to uh, enforce them. Um, having a monitoring program for inspections, you know, conservation commissions know how to do this. Conservation commissions do this all the time for wetlands. I hope they do. Um, but they certainly should, that you go around, you make sure that the restrictions are being enforced. But you got to do the same thing with historic preservation. Affordable housing restrictions are monitored. Preservation restrictions should be as well. But again, it takes capacity. Um, and then thinking about having an experienced preservation architect available to work with you on building inspections and documenting compliance and so forth. Uh, when you have, uh, you know, any work going on on a property that is subject to a restriction, having make sure you have the capacity to actually say, is the work being done in accordance with the restriction? Again, you may not have the ability to do that in-house, but you could have on-call consultants to assist you. I think that's it. There's plenty. Anyway, I think we'll take any questions or comments and... Wow. It's been a fun project, it really has, but um, you know, I guess to the commission first, I mean, if you have any questions or comments for us. Uh, I guess I'd be interested to hear what members of the public have to say. I mean, I have a zillion thoughts, like there's a lot of, my mind is still kind of processing all those things, but knowing that people's time is limited and we'll be here next month again, <laughs> maybe hearing from the public would be appropriate. Sure. 
I think what we would, should probably do for that is um, any questions in person, we'll take first, and then we'll go to the Zoom room um, to see if there are any questions from Zoom. I actually can let you guys run this for me, right? I can sit down at this point. Can I? <laughs> um, so if anybody here has questions, um, we should come up to the podium so the, um, you can use the mic. Thanks. Um, with all the uh, recommendations for inventory, do you have that like graphically mapped somewhere? Like what that means in terms of like in the city? Yes. That's an appendix that's yet to be issued. It's coming. Okay. We've tried a couple of different ways to map it, and I've come to the conclusion that we have to go the tough way, which is just taking a little more time than I. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. The map is coming. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is here. I don't have to get up, do I? I can just sit right here. This is cool. So I, I just had a, 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 like Steve, I have a lot of thoughts um, that are spinning around in my head. One thing that would be really useful to us, because I know that you, Judy, and you, Kathy, have worked in so many communities around Massachusetts, if you could provide maybe informally some examples of communities that have done things well, like um, who has a great inventory or what communities have preservation planners and staff and how have they funded those. Um, I had a couple other notes in here about that. It just kept coming up as I was going through it. Um, that's always really helpful just to kind of get pointers and see if um, some, it would apply to us. So. Uh, uh, we didn't look or compile this information statewide, but the Mass Historical Commission could easily uh, tell you uh, which uh, cities and towns in Massachusetts have professional uh, preservation planners on staff. Um, the ones that I've encountered tend to be in the Boston area yeah. and in Lowell. Um, but really, it's uh, getting to the point where so many, uh, because preservation planning is becoming more and more integrated with the, the big planning picture in most communities, uh, really, if a, if a community has a planning office, which most do at this point, um, now uh, somebody in the office is tasked um, probably unfortunately for them with also covering uh, preservation as well. So they may not be uh, designated preservation planners per se, but covering uh, preservation um, issues in addition to uh, uh, general, more, more general planning functions. Um, one thing I should mention, because this has come up m many times in the uh, uh course of this project is in terms of those neighborhood conservation districts, Cambridge is hands down uh, the gold standard for neighborhood conservation districts. And they have uh, created four so far since the mid-1980s. They have had a fifth one under study since 2019. And if anybody can craft a a general or home rule ordinance for neighborhood conservation districts and get it approved by the attorney general's office in this particular post 19 or 2019 decision climate it's cambridge um, so that will be very interesting to watch and actually i checked in with them last friday and they coincidentally are in the process of tweaking some of their ordinance language. Yep. But the key to understand with Cambridge, they've had great success with neighborhood conservation districts. But the downside is that too many communities have taken Cambridge's ordinances, ordinance, ordinance, and then started freestyling with it yep. and deleting here and adding there. And we're going to make it more like us. And this is one of the reasons why some of these neighborhood conservation districts now uh are problematic. So my recommendation for uh, looking at Cambridge is if they uh, do succeed in, and it's very likely they will, um, in getting their latest district uh, approved by the attorney general's office, that would be a very useful model 
but don't change anything except the name of the historic district because the folks in Cambridge, they're professional preservation planners. They are exceedingly experienced, savvy, and disciplined, and they know when to stop. And that's key with these neighborhood conservation districts. So every word and every punctuation mark in their ordinance is there for a reason. Um, so that my eye would be on Cambridge to see how the whole neighborhood conservation uh, district as a general ordinance um, shakes out in the next few months. We are also um, planning to talk to Margaret Hurley in the attorney general's office just to get a sense of what they have seen uh, from the towns that are subject to their review uh, and maybe get a few thoughts from her to amplify this discussion only because Cambridge is Cambridge. It's got all this capacity. It's big. It's whatever. And God, they do it so well. Um, but I'd like to just get some input from her as well that might be relevant to perhaps smaller communities. So um, she's she's just very helpful and she sees the whole state. So we're going to check in with her. I have a, I, if it's just sort of following up on that, your recommendations talk about um, architectural preservation districts and focusing more on that. And we have some form-based code um, standards already. And so I heard you talk about that as sort of um, potentially getting sort of getting at this um, very similar, if not the same issues, um, which might um, be um, instructive for Northampton, particularly given the review procedures that are required for any kind of development. Um, and, and that, that is true. Um, I mean, you certainly can accomplish a lot of this, a lot of the similar objectives mm -hmm. with a form-based code. I think my only caveat, uh, having seen some form-based codes that are delivering what they were intended to and some that are not, is to just make sure that when you go down that path, that you establish a district with sufficient documentation that you won't end up with unintended consequences. And in a lot of ways, I think the same is true even with a historic district. I was like, you have to have the documentation to know what it is that your, that your preservation objectives should be aiming toward. And I, I think with zoning, it's it's the same thing. So just to make sure that you really have the forms documented that you are trying to emulate, preserve, build upon, mm -hmm. um, and celebrate. Hi. I just wanted to say something about that. Um, uh, that slide you showed of the survey where you had to pick A, B, or C, okay. which was most important to you. And I was probably one of those people who said, why isn't there a D, all of the above? <laughs> and I think, and you were saying, no, 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 you, it's, one of them is preservation planning, one of them is zoning, and one of them is, say, conservation commission issues. And I think the point I would like to make about that is there just needs to be an emphasis on saying these people have to talk to each other. Yeah. Right. And I can't remember if you really addressed that in here. And I think it's it, it's something that we really should, um, you know, not think of them as separate silos, but right. that they all have to inform each other when when ordinances are made or decisions are made. Exactly. That's fair. Thank you. Um, this is more something that, I guess I wanted to ask you to think about um, because this is being done in the context of the sustainable Northampton plan. Um, are there, do you think that there are some definitive ways that preservation in Northampton does or could advance some of the goals in the other elements of the plan? Um, economic development, housing, natural resource production, just to, to integrate. Right. And I kind of put you on the spot. So maybe think about it. Well, I, back to me. <laughs> um, I mean, there's there's no question that historic preservation can tie into each one of those of those uh, components of sustainable Northampton. And that's where uh, we're kind of in many ways, the scope of work for this project um, was typical of a standalone preservation plan. 
which would get into those issues. You know, what are your recommendations for tourism, for example? What are your recommendations for property acquisition? Um, but because this was crafted as sort of an element of the comprehensive plan, that's why we didn't go down uh, that road with with some of these issues that that some cities and towns are getting answers to because they're doing a, a full blown preservation plan. Um, so that's uh, there are a lot of uh, good examples that have come out recently in uh, Sudbury in Beverly. Yep. Um, Barnstable is not so recent, but uh, yeah, that, that's a good one too. So uh, yes, it's uh, we probably should put something in our document that indicates that there are these other yeah issues that preservation planning or preservation plans typically look at, but because of the um, the direction that this uh, oh. study was intended to to go in, um, we didn't get that get get to those, but it doesn't mean that they shouldn't they aren't worthy of attention. I, I will say when we spoke with the preservation planner in Cambridge, who showed us some really awesome examples of infill developments that they had um, approved uh, within their historic districts, their, just their neighborhood conservation districts. He was, he spoke to this issue of, you know, we're not trying to stand in the way of other city, valid city planning concerns. And he said specifically, you know, we we need housing. So not using preservation to stop housing. Right. And some of the examples, they were they were wonderful because they really the architecture was very different, but in scale right. it worked. So I think there was definitely a consciousness there. Of course, it's one large planning department and it's gigantic. They all talk, to your point. They all talk. Well, in, I know, for example, in Springfield, I don't know whether this has been advanced, but there has been had been some discussion in the past about um, through their preservation trust yep. um, trying to encourage redevelopment of um, historic properties within the city into affordable housing and providing incentives for that to happen. And then um, I'm also thinking of Salem, which does have a full-time preservation planner, <clears throat> you know, to... I mean, history fuels the economy there. So it's a little bit different, but um, they really have made an effort to kind of uh, put preservation at the forefront because they know it brings so much money to the city. Sure. And, you know, do you think that this there's an opportunity here to do at least some of the same? Well, I think, Judy, you mentioned in your presentation talking about, um, you know, uh, allowing flexibility for the reuse of these buildings. And so we've started down that path a little bit, particularly with the places of worship, the historic institutional buildings, but that could be sort of further explored, I think is what you were saying, which would get at housing and economic development potential, I think, by creating more flexible reuse opportunities for those buildings. You know, I should also mention um, in New Hampshire, which we are not in right now, but New Hampshire, um, where we're doing a lot of work right now on some housing studies, New Hampshire has a specific provision in their, their state laws providing for tax incentives, locally approved tax incentives to uh, encourage reinvestment in um, buildings that need help um, to be able to redevelop them in part for affordable housing. So the... Um, the agreement for a tax incentive, which can vary anywhere from five to 10 years, is uh, is contingent on a certain percentage of the units being affordable or in New Hampshire's terms, workforce housing. There's nothing that stops a Massachusetts community from doing the same thing because you can exercise that through home rule. I mean, there was some loosening up in Massachusetts of the urban TIF regulation several years ago to do affordable housing, but Amherst has a home rule petition that allows them to enter into tax agreements to, um, you know, to leverage affordable housing. So we should make sure we mention that. I actually had not. And that was shame on me because that's something I know something about. So. Um, I just can we have comments as can I ask uh, make a comment as well as a question? I guess maybe it's part comment, part question. Um, one about sustainability and how we frame it, how we talk about it, um, and the other about incentives. So first, I think um, 
there seems to be an anticipated fear that preservation is all regulation, preservation is all problems, preservation is something to avoid. Um, and I think instead we could come out in the first sentence of the executive summary and say uh, preservation is sustainable. The greenest building is the one that's already there. I, I think we need a change of tone to be more positive about what preservation gets us, that preservation gets us many of our other goals. The preservation is not a hindrance to other things that are in the plan, but in fact, preservation is a vehicle or a way of doing that. So I, I would like to see mm -hmm. um, that tone and that theme throughout the plan. And I think that there's plenty of good ideas that have come up already, but I think it's a little bit of a shift because I, I think, um, and I'll call myself a preservationist because that was my former career and still a topic that I teach. Um, but as preservationists, um, I, 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 I don't think it's good for our social campaign, for our social cause, as Michael Tomlin calls it, um, when we emphasize um, how difficult it can be, or we are thinking about uh, tropes about painting your house a certain color or those sorts of things. And we don't say enough about how preservation can get to goals for a better city, a better community, that sort of a thing. Um, and I think it connects to my second comment, which is that we could think a lot more creatively about incentives. Um, so historic tax credit, I don't think it's any mention in the plan yet. Um, there are obviously state level incentives. Um, the question of where the money comes uh, from to do this, you know, so we we sort of have a, um, a homeowners type of question, but we have a lot of other types of buildings and other types of funding for preservation projects. And I think a little more attention to um, how we could do that. Some of that is what realtors are doing. Some of that is what banks are doing. Um, but even just to say there's a lot of ways to creatively finance, like, you um, that it could be tax credits, it could be um, grants, it could be other incentives, but just to um, give that a little more push and as well too. So those are my two comments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Nathan, is there anybody on Zoom that has their hand up? Uh, yeah, we've got one person. Um, yeah. Hi, uh, Jacqueline McCraner, uh, Northampton, Mass. Uh, my, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Um, I wanted to thank the planning board, the historical commission, um, Judy and Kathy. Thank you so much for putting together this um, wonderful first draft of the historic preservation plan. And um, I think I speak for several folks here tonight when it sounds like there are some lovely ideas out there. I hope they're pursued. Um, the city has a history of having studies done and there needs to be, you know, proper follow-up. So I hope that inventory forms are updated, that departments do start coordinating more and having more open communication, um, not just for city-owned historic treasures, but just so that um, we're able to preserve what we have here in Northampton, which is very special uh, in, in neighborhoods and for other, for other historic landmarks as well. Um, there's so many things I want to say. I think there, you know, historic preservation is very important. Nowadays, sustainability is so important as is equity and social justice issues. And, um, here in Ward 3 and in Ward 5, where we have been experiencing some incompatible new development and construction, uh, the topic of neighborhood conservation districts is very important to us. And we've also been following uh, the ruling of the land court for the town of Brookline in 2019. We also feel that Cambridge will be able to create its fifth um, NCD without problem. And we look to uh, Cambridge as a, a great example of having NCDs uh, successfully kind of um, harmonize new construction and historic preservation. So, so we're very happy to be kind of on the same page about Cambridge. And uh, we just look forward to having 
those conversations more about Northampton um, because we really feel that our neighborhoods deserve uh, better protection. So I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you so much um, for a, a beautiful presentation and for all the hard work. Thank you. Who's next? Next is Chachi. I'm sorry. Jackie, uh, uh, you can unmute. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, it's a wonderful presentation. Uh, it was so uh, skillfully done. I want to say for one thing, I, I live in Bay State and we had a uh, guided tour of our historic Mill Village Center on this weekend. A couple dozen people showed up and since then more than a dozen more have asked for the notes from the tour. We have suggested that for, we get some teenagers from the neighborhood to put up to create the signage to say you can stand in front of the cutlery building and, and read what you're looking at. It is, I think, compelling uh, history. And I would like to ask how, where, when can we see the video of this presentation? I know a lot of people I'd like to share it with, and I hope that the city will post a link to it uh, on the Historical Commission page. Could you do that? We'll have the we'll be able to um, post the video once it's um, cleaned up from um, uh, Northampton Open Media. Diane, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, that was a really fabulous uh, presentation and it hit on so many um, concerns and issues that we've brought up here in Bay State Village and other places too, but um, just something that uh, was said is is stuck in my head and I can't get it on, I just really have to speak to it. The issue of Nantucket being very, very conservative in what they allow to be demolished, um, because it's hard to get rid of the stuff. Well, the only difference between getting rid of the refuse from a demolished home on Nantucket and Florence is that we don't have to put it on a ferry, but it ultimately goes up or it goes to the the same places that are destroying our earth, global warming, all these stuff. We can talk about, we can talk about building, um, green houses we can talk about doing all that stuff but uh until we deal with the issue of what we're doing with the junk that we tear down and um haul off to our landfills it that's really somebody said it the greenest house is the greenest building is the one that's still standing that you work with and uh what an important point and i really look forward to the city taking some of these um suggestions and recommendations and putting them into practice because I think it would do well for our city to look carefully at how we're developing and using our infill um, infill ordinance and we can really correct how we're using our infill ordinance because I don't believe it's being used correctly but thank you very much for the presentation it was wonderful to be invited to it Chris go ahead. Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, Chris Hellman, I'm a member of the Northampton CPC, and I want to thank everybody for uh, their presentation and some really good information. Um, I want to focus on uh, some points related specifically to um, CPC, use of CPC funds um, for historic preservation. Two things that came up, one tonight and one in um, going through the report itself. Uh, this idea of um, the difference between his, in municipal buildings, the difference between historic preservation and uh, 
you know, routine maintenance, capital improvements. Uh, and the second is access of um, private homeowners to CPC funds for historic preservation. Um, what I'm really looking for, you know, is not necessarily a comprehensive answer, but um, we're going to have to come up with some guidelines, um, I think, on both of these. Um, the other alternative is to take them on case by case, and I think that that's a messy proposition, but we'll be looking for some guide, develop some guidelines on how we want to approach, you know, determining on the municipal side what's historic and what's maintenance. Um, and on the other side, how are we going to deal with the idea of public funds being used for private entities? Um, and I was just curious to hear if in your travels you had come up with, um, you know, the Cambridge model for either of those ideas. Uh, other communities that have, have taken on that discussion and come up with, with guidelines that we might find useful as a starting point. Thanks. Have you? My understanding, on. my understanding is that Brookline has adopted some guidelines around CPC funds for um, uh, for historic city, city town owned historic buildings, specifically to get at this issue of like how far can we stretch the meaning of um, preservation or uh, restoration under the statute. So I can look into that more. But my understanding is that at least Brookline has tackled that. Uh, and that's not subject to any kind of land court action as far as I know. So uh, we can certainly look at that uh, for you. Uh, most of the private property um, investments of CP funds that I'm familiar with, I'm just speak for myself, are really around um, a house of worship or uh, or some type of a community facility that is publicly used but is privately owned. Um, I believe the towns of Hamilton and Wenham have done some of that. So that's what those are the private types of private properties I'm familiar with as having been uh, has ever been recipients of some type of CP, CPA assistance. I'm not aware of any you know private homes per se that have. I don't know, Kathy, if you have. No, but uh, the uh... Some uh, resource that I've used a great deal is um, the the statewide database for projects in other towns that have been yeah. funded with uh, CPA funds. Right, and by sorting through or you know sorting by keyword, uh, you can come up with pretty easily with a list of towns and how long ago they did it. Yeah. is it current? Is it something that dates back ten years? How much money did they spend on it? And I've found that database to just be a huge help in sort of focusing um, on what towns to to look into further for uh, a specific issue. The, the town of Easton, I know for a fact, um, used CPA funds for a project to save uh, an old shovel shop that was going to be demolished for a Chapter 40B development and instead <laughs> stepped in and used their CPA resources, dividing them for both affordable housing and historic preservation to save that shovel shop, bring in a new developer who then did a low income housing tax credits and historic tax credits project. That's an absolute award winner. It's gorgeous. Yeah. It's, it's beautiful. Is that Ames? Yeah. It's, yeah. Ames shovel shop. It's gorgeous. Easton. Easton. Yes. E-A-S-T-O-N. Easton. They did a great job. Anybody else with their hands raised to make them? Is that it? No, yeah, nobody. That's it. Any other comments in the room? Yes. I'll make one more. I, d I just realized that I like launched into two things that I think you should do, and I didn't thank you for all of your work. I know there's like a lot of work that went into this. So please don't think I only have, you know, harsh things to say. So um, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for your research. I mean, there is a lot of material in here, and I think one of the one of the um, things we need in a plan is the kind of reference book of all of the information that is uh, useful for commission members, particularly, but also for the community. So to bring all that information together and present it. Thank you for your work tonight. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just echo what Steve and Barbara said. Um, 
You know, we have been on this commission a long time and we really have come a long way just in having you. We really um, struggled for a long time, just sort of being very reactionary and um, not doing a lot, not being very relevant. And I really feel like you've put the commission in a much better position to exercise its value in the community. Um, and I'm hoping that, you know, we'll be able to take some action here. Um, but I have to thank you. It's been a long process for you. This is not the easiest community to work with. I, although I know from my own experience, no community really is. But um, yeah, so I think it's, we just appreciate all the effort that you put into it and, and your brains. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I think there's Here's a comment over question. here. Hi. Um, this was a very interesting presentation. Um, I own and lived in uh, on Elm Street for 23 years, and it's a Victorian house. And I love my neighborhood because we all know that if we want to replace something, especially outside, that we need to keep our historical setup. And we haven't had any trouble in 23 years that I know about. And... Um, I remember when I needed to change my storm windows on the first floor, the house is 7,000 square feet. So I needed, I interviewed five different companies and only one was able to give me specifics on how to replace those storm windows exactly the way they put them together years ago. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important because if we lose that and people start changing things, then we lose it. So I was wondering if any of you guys have in mind setting up another historical district like the one we have, or they just want to, you know, preserve things the way they are. That's really, I think, a question for the commission. Yeah, I don't think that establishing additional local historic districts is out of the question, but it does. It's a process that has to take place. Um, forming a study committee and forming all you know, getting all the people who own properties involved. It, I know the North, the Elm Street area, um, which is where you are, correct? You're on Elm. On Elm Street. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know that district was formed in in response to the very insensitive alteration of a um a property in the neighborhood brick uh brick mastering in a, a porch to make an additional apartment in a, a multifamily uh, home and it took years to get that passed um but it, you know it did and it's remained in place so I, I don't think it's out of the question but it is it's it's an effort and it also has to be partly um grown out of the the neighborhood you know, the community, the property owners, they have to really be in, involved. So I don't know if that answers your question or not, but. Well, I was just wondering because uh, we do have um, some areas that the owners have preserved the houses the way they were intended to be. Mm -hmm. And I think it's wonderful that people like them and me value you know, all that effort. I remember when I went to buy my place, I had a, um, an architect come in and look at the structure. And he was amazed of the good condition that it was in because whoever built that house in 1860, you know, did an absolutely incredible job. And uh, if anyone buys things, Preserving it is important because that's history. For me, it is. So I just wanted to find out if your thoughts on uh, getting together some other, you know, assigning historical areas <laughs> so they can preserve them. I'll, I'll just echo Martha's comments and say I think that the commission 
um, one of our roles is working together with the community, right? So we would always welcome that kind of inquiry or that kind of question. Um, and that a lot of the presentation that we heard today was about the, the background um, information that we have in order to make those decisions, right? So those inventory forms are the sort of basic historic facts. Another one is existing National Register districts, and we heard tonight there's eight of those. So I think the question of are there existing National Register districts, um, which in and of itself pro provides very little protection, but provides a lot of symbolic meaning and pride for the community, would some of those uh, possibly be a local historic district? So I think these elements that we heard about in the plan, they sort of all build together, right? You need the background information, you need community support, you need support from the council eventually, right? Who would have to adopt this as a law. Um, and the historical commission has a role to play in that too, which is um, being a place where people can talk about those issues, bring up ideas, think about what a study committee might look like, those sorts of things. Um, but I think it's a great question, right? How could, considering that, that is the single most effective form of protection, um, uh, when and where would they be appropriate in other parts of the city? So thank you for your comment. Well, I appreciate all the hard work because I know what it's like to put things together and organize things, time consuming. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you both and your team, the rest of your team that's not here tonight. Um, this has been great. And like, as Martha said, sort of a long process, but we um, know that it's important and especially about the integration with the rest of the Sustainable Northampton Plan and the overlap. And we do internally do have a lot of conversation. It's not, we're not working entirely in silos, but that's what's really important about having this component um, be speaking and complementary and integrated with the rest of the plan. Um, and so the work that, you know, you will continue um, after this will be um, very helpful. So, and thanks to everyone who joined on Zoom and in here, some of you have disappeared, but that's okay. So thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you.